Thank you, Tom. Can everybody, everybody hear me fine? Yes. Great. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Tom, for inviting me, and Maxine, and Chris. Uh, it's, it's, it's great to be here and share with you some of the enthusiasm I have for the work that we're doing at Scripps and, and my group collaboration with Laura Bond in particular on uh, the pain reliever and opioid crisis. Um, it's, uh, it, I'm a medicinal chemist, so I'm a senior director of what's called molecular medicine, which is basically academic drug discovery. But don't worry, I'm not going to give you a chemistry talk. It's going to be non-technical. I hope everything is accessible. Uh, I want to give you the overview of, of what, what we're doing that I think everyone can understand. So if you're, a, if, you're already, if you're a scientist, it might be a little beneath you, but I want everyone to uh, not feel that they're overwhelmed by lots of data or lots of jargon. So it's not going to be here. It's going to be a, a high-level view of, of what we're doing in this particular area. And I think, first of all, um, as I go out in the community, a lot of people don't really know what Scripps does. They think we're a, a biotech company, and we're not. Uh, in fact, we're not even a for-profit venture. We are, is it a university? Well, we're not like University of Florida or Florida State. We don't have an undergraduate population. We don't uh, make money off of tuitions or anything, but we are a graduate school. Specifically, we grant PhDs, and we're focused at least particularly on the Florida campus, in biomedical research. And we have graduate students earning their PhDs. We have uh, faculty like me, staff scientists. Most of them have already earned their PhDs. And also support personnel like HR, IT, what you would have in, an, in a company. And our research is funded, well, originally we were funded by the state of Florida and Jeb Bush and, and the effort to bring us here, which was, which was great. At this point, we've transitioned to funding through NIH grants. We're always interested in ph philanthropy. And the long-term plan is to get a, a licensing, a regular licensing stream of income to really endow the institute. Um, that's, that's the future plan. It could be the present plan, I think, if people had looked at that uh, sooner. I mean, there are, there are drugs on the market that were relied on Scripps patents, like Humira, all these monoclonal antibodies. The, these biologics relied on that. But it was licensed out, the patents, very early at very low margins. And so the idea is to do that more in the future and to really endow the graduate program with royalty streams from, from drugs. There are two drugs now in phase three clinical trials that are exactly targeted to do that. So we think within five years or so, we want to endow the graduate program um, so that these, these people are, are fully supported. Now, as I said, I'm a medicinal chemist, and my focus is drug discovery. Uh, a lot of projects in cancer and neuroscience, and generally we focus on um, unmet needs. Difficult diseases, high priority targets, new approaches to drug discovery. And it's very collaborative, so I will, uh, I will give you, you know, particularly as it advances, we're at the early stage, but it involves chemistry, biology, animal pharmacology, toxicology. And as you get into clinical trial design and everything you have in production of materials, you got engineers, clinicians, statisticians. It, it's, a, it's a very you know, long and, and uh, multidisciplinary process. But today I'm going to focus on our early stage research and investigations into uh, safer pain relievers. And we're going to look at the, at the opioid system. Um, and I'll explain a little more why we, that has been our focus, but opioids have been used for thousands of years for pain relief and, frankly, to, to get high. Um, there are Sumerian tablets that describe how to cultivate and extract uh, heroin and other substances from the opium poppy. Some of the very first drugs, you didn't, wouldn't necessarily think they were marketed drugs in 1816 before... Uh, uh, the year Indiana became a state, where I'm from. Um, but uh, morphine is one of the first drugs, and this is the chemical structure. You see it's very similar to even to hydrocodone, a modern variant, and synthetic opioids that have emerged, uh, such as fentanyl, and this sort of foreshadows part of the problem. Prince, the entertainer, died of a fentanyl overdose just a couple of years ago. 
And this gets to the, the crux of the problem, the, the opioid epidemic. And this actually underestimates the problem because this only shows through 2014. This is a heat map of deaths. Uh, you can't really see it, but I think it's uh, um, 200 deaths per, per million um, residents. So the opioid, you know, was very uh, isolated and rare event in, in the turn of the century, but now it's everywhere. And if you updated this for 2018, I'm pretty sure the whole thing would be pretty red. Um, and this is another look at the same information uh, that goes a couple more years. And as I mentioned, 2014 would be here. So we're, we're in the steeper slope. Uh, and these top three are different classes of opioids that are abused and actual deaths from opioid overdose. And the biggest contributor are these synthetic opioids, such as fentanyl, that, that not necessarily get used as pain relievers, but are often added to the street drugs that people buy, and they think they're getting heroin or something dangerous, but maybe not as deadly as the fentanyl would be, but that the fentanyl in there is, is causing the problem. Um, and now we think that in 2018, there's a death from opioid overdose every 11 minutes. So during my talk, three people uh, in the United States will die of an opioid overdose. And the faces are all over. We, we know the famous people, but it's not, a, it's not a, an affliction of the famous. It, it is the affliction of teenagers who, who get the wrong thing from the wrong person. This is an actual photo that the police took of these two grandparents who were overdosing in a car in Ohio with their grandchild in the back seat. They survived. They, they took naloxone, Narcan, and the rescue agent. But this is, this is an actual photo of two two elderly people who, who overdosed with uh, their grandchild on board. Um, so let's get at the crux of the problem. These opioids, uh, all that I've mentioned, how do they work? I mean, your, your body has a lot of these, um, a lot of these proteins. This is uh, the cell membrane, and this is a protein that it has these helices that go across the cell membrane. And what these are are basically small molecular machines that transmit a chemical signal. So you have a lot of chemical communication going inside your body all the time from your coffee, from the caffeine stimulating the receptors that make you feel more alert and awake. That is a chemical message. There's a lot of, of natural and unnatural chemical messages that are going on. With the opioids, the opioid drug binds to this protein changes its shape such that another protein goes on to intracellular side. This is outside the cell, this is inside the cell. And then this dissociates and, and carries all the chemical messages that, that your body realizes it's had an opioid drug. So, um, and the, the dogma had always been, at least until the turn of the century, and maybe if, and some people are still uh, believing this, that these, G-protein coupled receptors is what they're called, are actually on-off switches. And all drugs either bind to them and prevent them from ever being activated or activate, it, activate them and carry this signal. That that's all they do. Uh, drugs such as an antihistamine block the histamine receptor and that's why you don't sneeze anymore. Uh, drugs like opioids activate the receptor and you get pain relief. And everything was thought to be through the action of this G-protein like, a, like flipping a switch on and off. But, and and this, is, this is a movie that I put together that just shows this. The, the purple balls are, uh, are a drug that's binding to this receptor here, the opioid receptor. It changes its shape, sort of illustrated by this flash here. And this intracellular protein, the G protein, comes along and that initiates the signal. So again, that was thought to be uh, completely understanding, uh, an easy principle to understand how these receptors work and how this chemical communication system works within your body. But we found that it's not so simple, that the mu opioid receptor, MOR, I'll use that abbreviation, it's not an on-off switch. Um, there are not only the G protein signaling pathway, there are other signaling pathways. And so most molecules bind to this, change the shape of that receptor, and activate both signaling pathways at the same time. So 
And this other signaling pathway is called the beta arrestin pathway because it was thought originally to arrest the effects of the opioids, uh, the, the uh, communication system, basically tone down the signal, but it actually is a different signal. And so, hypothetically, people had the idea uh, that you might be able to find an opioid that would activate one pathway that's more associated with pain relief and activate the pathway that's more associated with side effects to a much lesser extent. This is hypothetical. None of the opioid drugs do this. They all activate the signaling pathways equally. But there was strong evidence for this, and this came with the you know, genetics revolution. Uh, about uh, 15 years ago, my colleague Laura Bond, who's an animal pharmacologist and is very interested in, in opioids and pain relief and in general and addiction, she engineered some mice that were incapable of producing this arrestin protein, so this other alternative signaling pathway. And so ask the simple question, what happens when mice take opioids and don't signal through arrestin because they don't have any arrestin, they only do the G protein signaling. What happens is you give them morphine, they feel pain relief. I'll go into how we measure pain relief in mice, but they're, 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 they're effective in relieving pain and the mice are normal behaviorally, they don't look like they're having any weird effects. But then you try to overdose them on morphine, and what happens? Not much. They don't show this respiratory distress of what kills people from opioid overdose. They don't show the chronic constipation that you see from opioid overdose. And they don't see drug tolerance, which is when you have to take a higher and higher dose of the same drug over time to get the same amount of pain relief. These mice, after three weeks, are having the same dose for the same amount of pain relief that they were on day one. So they don't become tolerant to it. So, of course, the problem is that this was still very theoretical. Molecules capable of distinguishing these signaling pathways were completely unknown. So could we, could we get analgesia without these side effects? And one of the side effects we, we focused on early on is this, the deadly side effect of respiratory suppression. So the prevailing opinion in 2005, and opinion of a lot of people even today, that this is totally impossible. There is no way that you can get an opioid drug that will signal selectively for pain without all the other side effects you don't want. That, this is a combination you're stuck with. It is an on-off switch. If you turn it on, that's what you get. You get everything. After all, we've had a lot of opioid drugs. We've looked for new opioid drugs for 100 years, and uh, we've never found anything that does this. So it's kind of daunting to think that we could do it. But still, it was intriguing out there. That theoretically, it's really a, a, a rainbow, a full spectrum of activity that you might be able to find something that has a mix of the two signalings, or you might even find one that's selective for the G protein side. So Laura carefully looked at all the opioid drugs and see where they fall on this spectrum. And one of the interesting things is, is fentanyl, the structure here, was very much to the left, this beta arrest in the side effect pathway. That's why it's sort of notoriously dangerous. Uh, you, you get the side effects even when you're getting a minimal amount of analgesia. Things like morphine, hydrocodone, oxycodone are sort of more in the middle. But nothing is on the right, the, the unicorn that we're looking for, these G protein signaling compounds. So there was nothing known at all. So we started looking for them. And, and one of the reasons we thought we could is that we would go back and start with molecules that weren't drugs yet. They were not optimized, and maybe we could find something that just had a hint of the properties we wanted and then make them better. So I, I'm the chemist, so I decided, well, what sort of molecules do we want to study? And I made a lot of compounds that I thought would interact with the opioid receptor. And this graph shows the red and blue bars are two different biochemical assays, so two different measures of this activity in the, the red is the beta arrestin, so the side effect pathway, the blue is the G protein, the pain relief pathway. So sure enough, I made hundreds of compounds, the vast majority of them were just like fentanyl, inherently unsafe. There were very rare birds that, that uh, rarer birds that were balanced where the blue and the red are about the same, and the very rare bird here, the blue over the red, 
that is at least tilted in the right direction, maybe not enough to do a whole lot of good, but it gave us an idea of how to, how to get this property and maybe we could fix this. You could do what we do, the chemists do, is look at the structure, find out what it's doing, let's change its structure, make more compounds like it. And over time, over time, you know, the fifth round of compounds we make, they look more like this. We're generating a lot of compounds that have the high blue and the low red. And you can quantify this difference between the, the G protein pathway, the pain relief pathway, and the side effect pathway in something that's called a bias factor. So we like to be biased. Bias is not usually a good thing, but we're talking about signaling bias, the way these receptors work. So we want a high bias factor for the blue, the G protein. We can quantify this, and we had, there were no compounds known that had a bias factor of greater than three when we started. And now we have about 30 compounds that are greater than 10, and some of them really, really high up there. So you see basically no effects of the side effect pathway. And this is, this is one of our compounds, 15099, and the, this is measures how well it activates this G coupling pathway, and low numbers are good. And the arrestin pathway, high numbers means it doesn't really do anything at all. So you notice there's like a 400-fold difference here. So theoretically, you could take a 400-fold overdose of this before you would see activation of the arrestin pathway. And, when we, and thankfully, when we gave it to mice, it hangs around for a while, half-life of nine hours. It doesn't get excreted very fast. You can even give it by oral dosing. You don't have to give it IV. 51% of it gets into the blood when you take it by the pill. And first we thought, we've got some interesting tool compounds. And then the experiment measured actually how, many, how much of it gets into the brain. And we found it to be exceptionally high. So we realized that even if these compounds are not super optimized for, for pain relief, for their potency, they're not fentanyl potent, but they get into the brain to such a high level that they could have, have effects. And this is, this is shown on this graph here. These are, these are experiments with four different compounds, and this is morphine. You notice it's low. The higher on the y-axis means more and more drug, and these are three different compounds, and this is in the blood, and this is in the brain, and notice there's a break in the graph because it would be way up here. <laughs> the brain levels are exceptionally high. There's five times as much in the brain as there is in the blood, which is quite remarkable. It's usually very difficult to do that. I mean, that's why... Brain cancers, for example, are so hard to treat because a lot of the cancer drugs don't get into the brain. So the brain is like a sanctuary for cancer metastasis, and primary brain tumors like, like, uh, like John McCain had are very difficult to treat because there just aren't a lot of options, a lot of drugs that penetrate the blood-brain barrier. But here we, we're starting with something that does that on its own quite well. And this is going to be a little busy, but... I, I, Told you, I, I'd tell you about the pain experiment. This is a, it's called a hot plate test. So I guess I would, I would draw an, an analogy to you putting your hand on the roof of your car on a, not a scorching summer day, but a pretty, pretty hot summer day around here. You put your thing on the, uh, your hand on the hood for a couple of seconds and you realize, I want to take my hand off. You're not burning your hand or anything, but it's uncomfortably warm. That's what's going on here. There's this uh, metal surface that is, uh, that is like 120 degrees, roughly 110 degrees um, Fahrenheit. So you put the mice on there, and when they rear up or lick their paws or anything, you take them off. You measure how many seconds it takes for them to rear up or lick their paws. Record that. Well, if they've taken a pain reliever, it, it takes them longer <laughs> to realize there's discomfort from the heat. So they'll stay on the hot plate longer, and that's a measure of the pain relief, or suppression of the pain signal. And there's a maximum time you take them off after 30 seconds or something, because you don't want any, any, any damage, any injury, or anything to the animal. So when you do this experiment with multiple doses of fentanyl, that's shown on the curve here, in the hot plate, hot plate latency, essentially the percentage of time to the maximum that they stay on the hot plate. And so a very low dose of fentanyl doesn't do much. You give a little more and a little more, and then you get the maximum effect. It's, fentanyl is hugely potent. It only takes a half a milligram 
per kilogram. So that's why you've heard about fentanyl. You can, a flake that you can barely see can kill you. It's, it's, it's extremely potent. Um, whereas morphine has a very similar curve, but it takes higher and higher doses. It takes about 12 milligrams per kilogram to get the, the full effect with morphine. So we took some of our, our compounds that we didn't think were quite optimized yet, but we did the same profile. And you know the effect lasts a little longer. You see it's a little bit stretched out. Um, but it, for these two compounds, it also maximizes out at about 12 milligrams per kilogram, this curve here and this curve here. So, and this, this little thing to the right is the, the genetically engineered mice that don't have the mu opioid receptor, so they don't have any pain relief response. So we know our compounds are not just making the mice sleepy or, or something like that. It is actually acting through this opioid receptor. So we concluded that respect with, with respect to pain relief, these two compounds are anyway were, were longer lived than morphine, but similar in potency. And there are other pain models like, like uh, where the mouse is, the tail is immersed in warm water and you measure how many seconds it takes for them to flick their tail out of the water. Very similar results, no matter what pain model you use. So, um, but the exciting thing is when we started looking at the side effects. And if you've been to the doctor and they've put this close pin type thing on your finger, that measures your blood oxygenation, they always want to see, hey, it's 91, it's 92, that's good, it's in the 90s. They say, if it's 85, uh, we need to give you oxygen during your procedure or whatever. You want blood oxygenation to remain quite high. Now, what happens with fentanyl, these are, again, several doses, but the one to focus on is the minimum amount you need to see the maximum pain effect. That's a half a milligram per kilogram. It drops the blood oxygenation in these mice we don't have a close pin to put on their paws, but there's a little patch that goes on their skin. Um, but it drops the blood oxygenation into the 70s. Morphine is not so bad at the 12 mg per kg, though it still drops it into the low 80s or high 70s. So at the minimum amount, and you can see when you overdose it, it gets a, a lot worse, and these mice are struggling to, to stay alive. What happens with our compounds? Um, the drug is statistically not any different from giving them the uh, placebo. At the therapeutic dose of 12 milligrams per kilogram, at double that and at quadruple that, the blood oxygenation doesn't drop at all. So it totally eliminates this respiratory, this breathing, this life-threatening th side effect of the opioids. And you know what causes this, this is their breathing rate normally changes on opioid overdose. So we also had telemeters that would count their breaths over a certain period of time. Their breathing rate is also, um, also not affected by, by these biased opioid drugs that are signaling through the pain relief pathway very cleanly. So we quantified this, and this is sort of a critical to people believing this. We made a lot of, lot of compounds that had different degrees of this selectivity for the pain relief pathway. We sort of lined them up, and the height of this bar is, is a quantitative measure of how safe it is. You want this to be really high. This means that you can take a huge dose and not see any respiratory effects. Fentanyl is at the opposite extreme. You see respiratory effects at the same dose or at lesser dose than you need for pain relief. We made some compounds very similar to fentanyl because we had a lot of those. Those were easy to find. They had the same effect. These compounds were made more and more and more selective and the safety window got higher and higher and higher. In fact, it was a linear correlation. These are the numbers for this, this bias factor in the mouse because it's a mouse experiment. And uh, so we, it was uh, important because a lot of people were sort of picking up on this idea of the two pathways and could we discriminate them? And uh, people were thinking, okay, I've got a biased opioid, I'm gonna go into the clinic with it. But when you quantify how biased it is, a lot of them were like this or less. And these compounds are in the clinic and I think they're gonna fail or they're gonna be, people are gonna think, okay, this mechanism isn't any good. These are still gonna be dangerous pain relievers. But we found out, you really need to totally, totally, completely select for this 
pain relief pathway over the side effect pathway to see it. So this idea of the signaling bias, it's not a yes or no thing. It's degrees of bias that you have and you want it to be complete. So like this, this compares favorably to some of the drugs that are in clinical trials and we would expect no therapeutic benefit or very minimal therapeutic benefit there on this respiratory measurement. So. So we, we feel that we've, we've nailed this issue of respiratory safety quite, quite directly and quantitatively, and we, we, we're studying it in other species that we're giving the compounds to, people, to uh, people who are doing research with monkeys and other things, and we're seeing the similar effects, good pain relief without respiratory effects. So that is, that is you know, what kills people. We, we've got some early evidence um, that we haven't published yet on the drug tolerance. We think that is avoided. You use the same dose over time as you initially started with. This constipation effect, you can fairly easily measure, you know, uh, over time how much the, these mice are going to the bathroom, it disappears. You don't have the chronic opioid constipation you see with these compounds. But the elephant in the room is this issue of drug reward are they still somewhat addictive? And we, we learned some lessons from this genetic model. Remember when we made the mice that didn't have the beta arrestin? If you measure whether they prefer to have water with a little morphine in it or just water, they do have a slight preference for the morphine containing water. Not as much as normal mice do, but it's still there. So we think that this addiction, this addiction profile has something to do with both signaling pathways, but if we totally eliminate the beta arrestin part, it's going to be less, and it might be manageable. Um, and I'll talk about ways we're, we're going to manage that, but uh, we think it, it's definitely going to be different, and it's probably going to be tolerable, and people are not going to take these drugs for, for addic addiction purposes. Now, I, I liken drug discovery to, to a, a hurdle, a hurdling exercise. You know, there are all these uh, obstacles to overcome along this long 10-year-plus pathway to a drug. First of all, we need to make the compound potent enough. Then, well, what if it's potent enough, binds to where you want it to bind, but only lasts for two minutes? Well, that's another hurdle to overcome. You need it to last hours. You need it to be safe, of course. And the, there's all these issues that we overcome one by one by one. We're intermediate. We're in the middle of the race, but we've cleared a lot of the toughest hurdles, I think, so far. And I think the, the, the idea is sound. This shows you just, you don't, don't focus on the, the numbers, but I think the, the uh, green versus white is, is quite enough. You know, one of the issues is let's look for side effects. Be not waiting until we put them in the people to see what side effects are there, what can we expect? So we measured how, how tightly one of our compounds bound to other proteins that are in your body. Generally, you don't want them to be affected. You want, these are color-coded green where it's not doing much at all. So this is a, a profile that was overall pretty encouraging, but there were some things that it was hitting. This is, this is the mu opioid receptor, which we want to have a low number here. This is the kappa opioid receptor, which we weren't so thrilled about hitting. We found out it was sort of binding non-specifically or non-productively to this, and it wasn't really doing anything. So that's not anything to worry about. This was something to worry about. This is an ion channel in your heart that controls your heartbeat. So we, this particular compound has some heart effects, or would have some heart effects. Um, this is a dopamine receptor, so this is... Uh, this is actually, people have tried to block this receptor to treat addiction. So this is kind of curious if we have some activity here of the right kind and, and our, our is, ours is dopamine receptor blocking, it might actually dampen any residual you know, addiction risk that we have. So this is actually encouraging rather than discouraging. And then there's another one, uh, this was the associated with the fen fen toxicity, again a heart heart uh, arrhythmia problem or valvulopathy problem. So we were very focused. Another one of these hurdles was to get rid of these heart side effects that might be there. And we made, we changed the structure of the molecule, figured out what was important for these heart effects. And we got rid of that without killing our activity or our, or our bias. So that, that is a hurdle that we've, we've overcome. Um, so 
I focused on the, this idea of a safer opioid. Again, that a lot of people don't believe can exist, but, but we're, we feel confident that it can. But I realized that that's not all that we need for this crisis. Um, we're, we're really taking a multi-pronged approach, or I think the uh, NIDA and the NIH is taking a multi-pronged approach toward addressing the opioid crisis. You know, safer, safer pain relievers that work on the opioid system, um, such as we're working on, can be a, a big contribution. So you don't have any addictive tendencies based upon what you take post-surgically in the hospital or whatever. Um, that that is important, but things like heroin and and uh, or other things are going to be affordable. So there's other other issues to address here. And also, are these compounds at all addictive? Um, we're picking up on this idea that they that some of these compounds might hit other targets that might curb the addiction. So some combination therapy or a combination of activities in one molecule can help with this. And there are at least two different approaches that seem to seem to have some validation in animals. And, and uh, both of these goals are sort of tied up in our, our recent uh, renewal of a grant with the NIH to look at this for the next five years. But another idea that we're not yet funded for is this idea that, well, heroin is always going to be cheap. People are going to take it to get high, whether they've had pain relief or need pain relief or not. So it's really sort of separate from this need for a safer pain reliever. What we need are rescue agents that improve the ability of these people overdosing to survive. Right now, most uh, patients and most uh, emergency technicians carry naloxone or Narcan with them. They give an overdosing person a dose of Narcan, either injection or preferably inhalation if they're still breathing. This works really well for, for heroin overdosing. It works well for many of the other opioids like uh, hydrocodone or even oxycodone. But it doesn't work so well for fentanyl, and that's driving the deaths that are going on because fentanyl is so darn potent. It binds the receptor so tightly much better than naloxone does to reverse it, that it's very difficult to save these people that are, are fentanyl overdosing. So this sort of lines them up for potency. These are the opioid drugs, and this is naloxone or Narcan, which is a blocker. It's more potent or binds it better than morphine or heroin, similar to oxycodone and, and uh, hydrocodone. But fentanyl is sort of at the high end of this potency, so if the person is overdosed so much that they're no longer breathing and you can't use the inhalation method of the naloxone, it's very difficult to rescue these people. So our idea is to, to build an opioid receptor blocker that's sort of more over here that will be effective for fentanyl and even some of the more potent fentanyl analogs. There are, there are some fentanyl analogs that are much more potent than fentanyl that were developed to anesthetize elephants and you know huge animals, and, and these are finding their way into street drugs. And it's just amazing how, how potent these are. So, but since some of our compounds get into the brain to such a high level, and we figured out how to change them from an activator to a blocker, we think we can do this and give a, get a better rescue agent. So that's, that's sort of the next project that, that we're launching and we're starting to explore on that. Um, so more rapidly brain penetrant, very potent blocker is what we need for this overdose rescue that will really save lives. Um, so that, that's really an overview of what we're doing on, on, on this project. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of approaches to pain. As I said, a lot of people don't think that opioids are, are worth exploring anymore at all. Um, so there are interesting approaches that can be complementary, I think, to this. You know, with the, the cannabinoid system, there's a, a there's some ion channel called NAV ion channels that are also interesting for pain relief, and a lot of these are working their way through clinical trials, and will be effective. We think the opioid system is is very interesting because it's is such a broad spectrum pain relief for acute pain, like post surgical pain and everything. That it is, if we can tease out this safety issue it will immediately find, find use in, in uh, the clinic and elsewhere. So I'd like to 
this, this wasn't all done by me. Some of the ideas were mine, but uh, I don't tinker around with the molecules much in the lab anymore, or, or certainly don't do any of the mouse experiments. I have a collaborator, Laura Bond, who's been interested in the opioid system uh, for a long time and made those genetically engineered mice. Um, her assistant, longtime assistant, did all the mouse experiments described here. Mike studied this, um, measured like the brain levels and the half-lives and the, you know, how, how the compounds behave in, in the animals. I've had a, a string of capable uh, graduate students and postdoctoral scientists who've worked on this project over the years. And uh, this grant, which just got renewed, and another grant to study the fundamental biology behind it. Um, and of course, I'd like to thank all of you, particularly Maxine, Tom, and Chris, who uh, invited me here. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Great, thank you. <clears throat>